This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's it's our weekend show. We're joined by someone I'm sure many of you know, Dan Mitchell. Uh, he's an economist. You probably know his work from many, many years at organizations like Cato and Heritage. But for our purposes, I think he is the best guy uh, in libertarian circles and in D.C. to talk about the federal budget, federal spending, and especially tax. Uh, so with that said, Dan, great to see you and thank you for your time today. Yeah, glad to be on the program. Well, I want to dive right into this. We all know we had this psychological breakthrough where the, the federal debt now exceeds $20 trillion. It's about 105% of GDP. Um, it's sort of a devil's advocate question. How do we get people to care about this? We've been talking about it forever. Ross Perot was talking about it in the early 90s. It was a trillion when Reagan came into office. It, it feels amorphous to people and, and nothing too bad ever seems to happen. You know what I'm saying? And and nothing bad does happen until you reach the point of being Greece, where investors no longer trust that you will repay your loans as a government. And and I don't like saying this, but we probably have decades where we can continue to overspend and borrow money uh, because guess what? The other dominoes will fall before us. France, Japan, these countries will hit a fiscal crisis before we hit a fiscal crisis. And that means lots of flight capital will come to the United States. And international investors still see U.S. government debt as a safe and sound investment. Uh, I wish they didn't sometimes. Yeah. But the reality is we can continue traveling down this path uh, of high debt for a long time. Yeah, it's astonishing to think about. And of course, we're the least dirty shirt in the laundry. The The other difference here is that uh, the status of the dollar as the world's reserve currency makes us quite a bit different when it comes to sovereign debt, uh, as opposed to some of these other countries, including Japan. You know, that, that gives us an advantage. Uh, but one thing I want to stress, I think it's important to understand that government debt is a symptom the underlying problem is a government that's too big and a government that's overspending. I worry sometimes if we just focus on the debt uh, and deficits, then yeah. you know Nancy Pelosi and Charles Schumer, they'll say, okay, yeah, I agree with you, so let's raise taxes, let's impose a value-added tax, a carbon tax, or something like that. So, so it's very important that, yes, the debt is not good. All this red ink is a problem. It's diverting capital from productive uses in the private sector, but again, it's really the underlying government spending uh, that's the problem we should be focusing on. Right. Who wants a balanced budget if taxes are high and spending's high? Uh, but um, so I want to talk about this this issue of who in Washington. We know where the Democrats are. Uh, Trump is not a Republican in my mind. The, the, we're in a crazy situation. There are, I hope, at least a few people who are serious about this. Maybe people like Senator Rand Paul, maybe someone like OMB Director Mick Mulvaney. Uh, is, is there anybody out there who's kind of an adult in the room on this issue? Well, the problem is without strong leadership from the White House, yeah. I don't think you can expect Congress to just by itself – uh, produce good legislation. And I say that, you know, for with frustration, because for years, uh, the House of Representatives would uh, pass these so-called Ryan budgets that had genuine reform of Medicaid and Medicare, uh, you know, good caps on discretionary spending. They really were, I mean, maybe by our libertarian standards, they weren't that great, but by Washington standards, they were really good budget plans. And then when the Senate went into Republican hands in 2014, mm -hmm. they even passed uh, budget resolutions that were pretty good. So the underlying theory was, oh, well, just get a Republican in the White House and we can actually solve or at least address a, a very big chunk of our long run fiscal problem. Uh, but Trump, Trump is a bit of a populist. He doesn't really seem to have any uh, uh, strong intention of dealing with entitlements. And then, of course, we saw just uh, in January, this budget deal where on the discretionary spending, they gave more money to defense and domestic discretionary programs. So I'm afraid right now that the, the I don't know whether the floodgates are open, mm -hmm. but there's definitely lots of water, I don't know, going over the dam, going under the bridge, but there's more spending and it's uh, we're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, there's no question. Trump is, is not a limited government guy and his uh, his infrastructure Themes, I think, are crazy. 
I, I want to talk about briefly about the role of the Fed in this. I, a lot of people don't understand how significant U.S. debt service is as a, as a portion of the budget. It's actually the fourth largest item. It's only about $300 billion these days. But with historically normal interest, interest rates, let's say 5 to 10 percent, this could it wouldn't take much to make servicing the debt the single biggest item for Congress every year. I, I don't think the American public gets that. If interest rates normalize, as is the uh, you know the popular phrase nowadays, and uh, and even if they go up higher, because let's say the inflation genie breaks out of the bottle, and then we wind up you know going back to you know not even the 1970s, but just to an environment where inflation is four or five percent, so interest rates are you know maybe six or seven percent, then all of a sudden you. The interest on the debt costs in the federal budget mm -hmm. at least will double and they could even triple. Uh, and this is one of these things. And here's the frustration with Washington. Politicians, their time horizon tends to be the next election. Worrying about things like rising interest payments on the on the national debt, worrying about the long run danger of entitlement programs. Those are things that those of us who think 10 years and 20 years down the road worry about. And Getting politicians to do that is not that easy. What concerns me is I, I think this puts the Fed in an inherently political posture. Who wants, you know, what Congress, what president wants to have the Fed raising interest rates and killing their budget? It, it, there, there's a, a political element to all of this that we don't think about. Well, I guess I'll start with the good news. We're not Zimbabwe. We're not Argentina. Uh, the central bank isn't printing money to finance government. Uh, we have lots of investors internationally who are willing to buy U.S. government debt. Uh, but at some point in time, could that happen? I mean, I don't like a lot of what the Fed does because they're playing Keynesian monetary policy, but they're not, again, they're not printing money to finance the budget. So they're, it's, it's two separate things that we have to worry about. One we have to worry about right now, i.e. the Keynesian monetary policy, and the second thing to worry about is the long run, which is, will we get to a point where like the European Central Bank is basically propping up uh, the welfare states of Italy and Greece by buying up all their dodgy debt? Well, what do you think of proposals? Uh, obviously, the Fed itself owns a fair amount of treasury debt. Uh, the Social Security Trust Fund owns a fair amount of treasury debt. What do you think of proposals to simply cancel uh, that portion of, of outstanding treasury debt, which would immediately alleviate maybe four or five trillion of this $20 trillion hole we find ourselves in. Well, I guess we have to figure out what's the real meaning and purpose of, of some of that debt, like the Social yeah. Security Trust Fund. Well, that's nothing but IOUs. All that happens is that the Social Security Administration takes one of these IOUs to the uh, Treasury Department and the Treasury Department credits them in their account and they get to send retirement benefits out to people. But of course, the way the Treasury finances that is by taxing and borrowing today. So the Social Security Trust Fund is just an accounting fiction. And in terms of the Federal Reserve, when they do their open market operations and they buy up U.S. government debt, of course, they're also buying Fannie and Freddie securities and things like that. But when they're buying up U.S. government debt, well, then is it disappearing? Is it vanquishing? Uh, vanishing, I mean. Uh, but what happens now that they're trying to unwind their balance sheet and they're selling some of this? Uh, now, do you cancel it? I mean, even if the Fed does complete normalization and brings their balance sheet, you know, cuts it in half, you're still going to have, you know, one and a half, two trillion dollars of, uh, of U.S. government debt on the Fed's balance sheet. So I don't, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't have a great answer for it. Well, a cynic might say that the Fed is enabling Congress and, and monetizing debt in a roundabout way. Uh, Dan has some TV obligations this afternoon, Fox Business among them. So we, we're going to leave him with one last question. And, and as you said, Daniel, this could be, you know, 40 years from now, we could have $50 trillion in debt and nothing too, too bad has happened. But, but just give us a hypothetical situation how this unwinds. Normally, when you borrow too much money, at some point, creditors cut you off. At some point, they require much higher interest rates. Um, you know, how could how could this potentially unwind in the future? How could how could this all blow up in our faces? Well, if you want to do a worst case scenario, at some point with the entitlements on autopilot, uh, 
and the yeah. changing demographics of the country. I mean, we're going from having a population pyramid to having a population cylinder, which means not enough workers and too many retirees, at least given the way that the entitlement programs are designed. And you can keep borrowing and you can keep borrowing and you can keep borrowing until that fateful day occurs. And all of a sudden, investors are looking around at each other and saying, wait, do we trust Uncle Sam to pay us back? And again, as I said at the top of the program, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, we have decades before that point arrives simply because other countries are in even worse shape than we are. But that doesn't mean that it won't come to bite us sooner or later. And that's why it's so important to try to deal with this overspending problem today so we don't have that kind of Greek style crisis in the future. Well, how about we treat treasury owners like uh, Iceland treated some of its sovereign debt holders and give them a little haircut? In other words, why should it be 100 percent risk free to buy a government debt of any country? Well, that's ultimately what we may wind up with a default. There was a, a de facto <laughs> default with Greece. Uh, and and again, you know, if, if it happens in the U.S. and when it happens, because, you know, God knows I'm not capable of making a good prediction on it. But when that happens in the U.S., uh, we probably will do a haircut instead of full full scale default. But believe me, when that happens, it's going to be very difficult for the U.S. government to borrow more money because interest rates are going to spike up because of mm -hmm. the uncertainty on whether the U.S. will either repay or fully repay. Well, it's an almost unbelievable situation. If you're interested in tax and budget, please follow Daniel J. Mitchell, at Daniel J. Mitchell on Twitter. He's the best guy in D.C. working in this area. And sometimes it's a bit dry, it's a bit technical, nuts and bolts, but it's so important for our future and obviously our kids' future. Dan J. Mitchell, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.